Well, we've passed that fail safe line. We are going to pay a serious price. It's just who's going to pay it and how long from now do we pay that? Today, I got a chance to chat with one of my favorite people, Wall Street legend, Peter Grandage. In this video, we're going to talk about where Peter sees junior mining and commodities heading in the second half of the year and through 2023. We talk about real estate and all the malinvestment that has been happening over the course of the bubble that was created since the beginning of the pandemic. Guys, I'm super pumped that you're taking the time to watch this interview. Peter is one of the easiest people to listen to. He is not like one of these standard finance guys who use big words and talk at a level that is effectively meaningless. Peter tells it like it is, and I'm really thrilled that he took the time to chat with us. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. So I got to ask you, just getting started here, over the last couple of years, we've seen you know just crazy amounts of stimulus thrown at the economy, whether we're talking about central bank balance sheets or government you know, fiscal packages. Uh, have you ever seen such a difficult time to assess where the markets are heading than this point in time right now? It's interesting you say that. I was just literally this today at lunch telling somebody after 38 years, I've never seen so many cross currents and I and I've never seen multiple roads that things can go based on what is done. In other words, if this is done, we go this way, but if they decide to do this, we go this way. And I I, I have to tell you, as good as, as when we speak, you know, the, the market had a good reflex rally, something I spoke about last night about a short term bottom. But it, there's still if there's a thousand people, there's nine hundred and ninety nine different opinions. And uh, it, it's just really quite interesting. Normally, if at this point in time, especially, you know, learning to see through the noise and all, I personally can have a real true one sided gut feeling. But there's a possibility of, you know, multiple avenues, depending on what choices are made by people that I have no power over. So so what do you think is happening right now with the U.S. dollar? Why is it that the U.S. dollar is rallying? I mean, we look at Joe Biden's presidency and there's recent data that came out that showed that the, uh, I think it was 64 percent of Democrats actually don't want Biden to run for a second term. So I think we can um, objectively look at his um, era as president as a bit of a disaster, but here the U.S. dollar is roaring. Why do you think that the U.S. dollar is rallying so much? And do you think that at some point this is going to become a problem where uh, the U.S. government is forced to step in? I don't think they're going to have to because I think I think we're reaching that peak. First of all, it's really been really viewed as a lesser of two evils versus something that's so much better than another choice. If you look at Europe, I mean, Europe has really got a series of problems. The Europeification never really worked. Some are basically saying that quietly on the fringe governments. Look what happened to Germany in this time frame, went from the most powerful economic forces to a country that literally, even though it calls itself green, is now burning coal. Uh, so the Europe, you know, is in a real bad way if they don't I think they have to kind of force some sort of deal in Ukraine in order that they can at least assure themselves of not freezing the debt this winter and, and amply get a Russian supplies again. And then look at the other major currency that we, you know, first it was the euro and then it was the yen. They've been on a suicide course of believing that they can just continuously keep low interest and no zero rates and keep, they're almost all their bond market. They literally, the government purchases almost all their bonds trying to get out of a, a huge deflationary period they were in. And, and at the same time, the United States started to raise interest rates, although I don't think it's going to be long lasting. So that's really what drove the dollar higher, not that suddenly everybody wants to own it. And of course, when we had a liquidity crisis, there's still people fall back on old ways and an old way is still you know running to the dollar until something changes. So- when we look at what happened in you know 2008 2009 effectively the fed uh made a journal entry to recapitalize the banks and called it quantitative easing do you think that we're going to get something similar like that happening here uh but in this case it's going to be we're going to do a journal entry to go buy a bunch of japanese bonds and uh european sovereign bonds well it's it's very interesting you know their last chance to fix this the right way 
was 2018 when they started to raise rates and then got spooked. And then, of course, the pandemic came and suddenly, you know, we added $10 trillion into our national debt in just a few years. And now they're painted in the corner because people have to fall back on this. This is a very important point. If you're going to talk about higher interest rates or people that are going to claim that they're going to be here and they're going to stay there, then explain to me how even at just 5% interest rate with an almost $31 trillion debt that doesn't include eventually having to pay Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid payments for money that's not sitting somewhere, that's going to be $1.5 trillion in interest expense. Well, listen, our best year was 2019. We took a little over $3 trillion in income. Half of our money is going to go pay interest expense. So it's a non-starter when somebody starts telling me, oh, interest rates can go to seven or eight. They may spike there, but if they stay there and stay there for any length of the time, the United States is, is you know, it's up the ca- it's up the creek without a paddle, okay? And so that is the quagmire that the Federal Reserve has passed their nose. Right now, they're focused on inflation. They blew it. They should have been tightening when they were loosening six to 12 months ago. And now they have an issue that they didn't have to ever deal with before. Past inflation cycles were mostly demand-driven. This is not just demand driven, it's supply constraint driven. And there they have really no influence to change that. They can work on the demand side, they can raise interest rates and tighten and and, and slow things down, but they can't change the supply constraints, many of which have political ramifications as well as general economic. We go up in a pandemic, Steve, as Americans and realize, wow, a lot of our stuff isn't made here. In fact, it's made partially or all in places that aren't exactly our friends, if not outright enemies. And so there's a whole lot of issues that this inflation cycle didn't have to the one that they last compared 40 years ago, when most of the financial advisors weren't even born, let alone experiencing that. So this is a lot different. So I, that's why I said, I'm not exactly sure what can happen. I know all the choices aren't good ones, but some could forestall the inevitable. There may be another one kick left in the can, like you said, and quantitative easing again and learn to live with five or 6% inflation or 7%. But the issues long-term, eventually the the people that pay the dearest prices are our children and our grandchildren. That's unavoidable. We've gone too far over the line. There was a great movie from years and years ago called Failsafe with Henry Fonda as president. And unfortunately, this plane goes off the bomb Moscow because they think we've been attacked. And it eventually goes over the line where the pilot is trained, doesn't matter who comes on, even his wife. Well, we've passed that failsafe line. We are going to pay a serious price. It's just who's going to pay it and how long from now do we pay that? So here's the difficult question is, uh, given the fact that there's no good choices, if you are, you know, a central planner or a government official, um, when you're talking to your subscribers or your clients, uh, about investing strategy, how, how do you position yourself in this market? Or are you mostly looking at going cash? Well, I did that, but then the old bug of Peter loving metals caught me, uh, (laughs) last year. I got so bearish that I literally said around this time, hey, you got to sell all general equity and bonds. You don't want to own any. And by the end of the year, this is an everything bubble that's about to burst. And when it does stocks, bonds, you know how much I dislike cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency and how much flack I took for that. But proven I'm not the one, Peter, that walked on the water for a very short time. I got back into gold uh, and and copper and and I very much like my uranium holdings. But I just think that we've had a, uh, a first crack in the market. The first cracks in the markets are usually the most vicious. And then the markets tend to go into choppiness, but overall work sideways to lower. And even if we stop going down, Steve, not only are investors keen and plans have been made with superior returns that they were getting, which aren't going to be in front of us. But financial advisors, most in the United States, haven't even worked during a period of time when it doesn't just go down and bounce back and go up, but it stays down for one, three, four years. So I just think 
we're on just the beginning of a, a much more difficult period. It may not be as volatile and it may not be as sharply to the downside, but I don't think yet you run out and you just buy the farm and take everything you can. I do think you look at things, there are a handful of them, which have already been just, you know, that everybody's despondent, depressed, et cetera. And those are things like gold right now and silver uh, and even copper is coming down towards that. You know, here's a metal that in 2000, by 2035, it's going to double demand that we currently have. And we're not even close to, to being able to meet that. And actually the decline now will forestall even more looking for the necessity that we need. So that end result is actually going to be better, even though we pay a little bit of price for it. But again, I don't think yet there's a reason to run out. And if you just look even at the junior resource market, it was annihilated. It didn't go down. It didn't get crushed. It's been annihilated. Prices of many junior stocks. I've never seen it vis-a-vis -vis what the underlying metal price is still. I think the market was better off when gold went under 300 than it did here at 1700 and gold stocks are off 80% from their highs. So there's a lot of damage. There's a lot of things to be worked through. And like you said, if you had to error, I would error on cash at this point versus wanting to be 100% or nearly 100% invested. Yeah, it's 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 challenging because it feels like junior mining's turned into a, um, a high risk, low return environment at best, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's it's made it really challenging, especially for a guy named Small Cap Steve that likes to invest in small caps and micro caps and nano caps uh, to actually go out there and identify winners when uh, it just it feels like there's no liquidity there, and even if a company comes out with strong news. That liquidity is just there for somebody to exit a position, and then the stock just ends up back to where to where it started. Bingo, Steve. You hit it, which most people are not talking about. The reason it went down is not that these companies are suffering, going to suffer and everything they could have possibly made are gone, but it's become a very illiquid market. It's not what it once was 20 or 30 years ago when brokers and all sorts of people built book of businesses around juniors, et cetera. There's probably six or eight funds in North America that write most of the checks for the juniors when, when they do placements and all. Well, those funds got hit not just because of the metals, but also a lot of them also buy other things like general equities and things of that nature. So they were sellers and there was nobody to bid them. And then of course, selling always begets selling. And when the retail sees selling, they are the quickest to act because most of them have made a plan based on emotion, not any long-term thinking. So that's really what's happened. But like it always does, babies get thrown out with the bathwater. So don't worry, small cap Steve will still be in business <laughs> and small cap Steve will have a smaller uh, stadium to work in. But there's going to be a lot less people sitting in that stadium with you. So vis-a-vis, -vis, if you're half as good as I think you are, you actually should do better going forward because a lot of the excess and a lot of the noise is going to be gone from that market. Mm -hmm. I uh, I guess I don't have to continue to fill out the Starbucks application that's sitting on my desk here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, What's what's the deal flow you're seeing the most right now? I'm, I'm sure you get pitched deals all the time uh, from, you know, gold to silver to uranium to, uh, you know, phosphate, you name it. Um, where are you seeing the uh, the most amount of just general um, interest in uh, raising money or decks thrown uh, to you over email uh, in, in terms of different uh, sectors uh, in junior mining? 2022 is dead, Steve. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're here we are, middle of July. December is always a month, no matter whether it's good or not. No, no business really gets done. The holidays kick in. The only real financing we're going to see is only one of two ways. Desperation financing to keep the lights on or yeah. keep a project going that wouldn't be able to go. Or one out of 100 that's done something phenomenal and people want to jump on board on that and all. And we'll know... We're seeing the desperation when it's full warrants, warrants at the same price of the current, not 50% higher. Those are all the classic things that happen after a market like this has been hit. Uh, that's why you know it, it's imperative if you're looking at new things or you're looking at what you should hold in your portfolio or not, you got to be able to be confident that your company can go 12 to 24 months 
we're not having to go to the market in order to continue moving forward. If not, it's going to be a real challenge for them, at least for the rest of the year. Yeah, the the the, the most money I've made in terms of just return size since I started investing was back in, I'd say 2009, 2010. There were a lot of, as you say, babies thrown out with the bathwater uh, that were still good companies that were going to survive that just they just went no bid. And, um, you know, I, I was relatively new to my investing career and I was at least smart enough to identify um, just how crazy undervalued some of these companies were. Uh, unfortunately, I ended up uh, investing in other stuff after that and giving up a bunch of those gains. Um, uh, but you, th- you think that when we look at these junior mining companies that are struggling right now to catch a bid that may, you know, have issues just financing themselves, uh, you think that most of them will still be around if this lasts two or three years? I don't think it'll last two to three years, Steve, but I know it's definitely going to last through this year and the early part of next year, unless metals suddenly, for whatever reason, I can't foresee take off, you know, very sharply to the upside. I think what this will finally do, something that probably had to be do, done in the last cycle and didn't, it's going to cause a lot of these personal one-on-one you know, run by one person, keeps free financing, keeps pulling a paycheck kind of deals. Those companies are going to go by the wayside and there's going to be a lot of force mergers. Companies are just going to have to say, listen, you know, uh, we have to combine and uh, that's the only way we're going to, we have to get bigger to attract an attraction. You know, if you look at the junior market, if you mind, just digress here, because I know this is of an interest to you. 20 years ago in the U.S., there were probably at least several hundred brokers, financial advisors, whatever they were calling ourselves at those days. And they built a book of business around companies like this. And each one of them had 100, 300, 500 clients. So when you got that broker or advisor interested and they liked your company, along came with a, a good part of their book. That's gone. That mm-hmm. market to attract those people. Now, those people may still exist. Those type of people may exist, but they're fragmented. And some go, you know, to, you know, internet and hear companies and things of that nature. But then the pandemic came. And so they weren't even able to go touch these companies and you go to conferences where a lot of these companies go and all. So, and then the compliance, then of course the government made overkill. I mean, you, you, you can't say anything unless you have stake. Well, I, I, I'm i a junior. I got, I got sizzle. I have to be able to talk about my sizzle because the only way I can get stake is I have to turn sizzle into stake. So it's been a big challenge. And then the exchange traded funds came. And unless you're in that exchange traded fund, institutions are ignoring you and so forth. So it's a big challenge. And I think this downturn finally is going to cause a lot of these uh, marginal companies to fold or end or merge. And and that'll be better for guys like you who do look for value and things more than just, you know, a, a two cent trade or something of that nature. There'll, mm-hmm. there'll be a lot less wasted money going into areas that shouldn't be. And that's the same that's going to happen with cryptocurrencies. They're all going to shake out just like the internet bubble did. Some will survive and those that will survive will will do it better. They'll learn their lessons. And then the ones that do survive will, will be, will, you know, be a better company overall. So I, I don't think, I, like I said, is, I don't think, is there a balance? Yes. But I think the, if you ask me to give you a letter to describe how the junior market's going to look, it's not a V, it's not even a U, it's an L. We're bottoming, but we're going to go sideways at best for most of them, at least for the rest of the year. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Um, I wish I could tell you something you've, better. You've 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 ruined my weekend. Um, uh, but you brought up crypto. Um, I I I was always on the same page as you on that one. Are you following everything that's going on right now with you know the Celsiuses of the world and the Three Arrows Capital? Does does it look like uh, the, the the bottom still has to have is is still going to fall on this thing? Steve, I'll tell you what I dislike the most about the whole thing about it. And I, I, I and I literally got a death threat over it because, you know, when these things were at the highs, I came out of the woods and I just said, listen, this thing is going to collapse blah, blah, and just got beaten up, you know, just mostly from people that didn't have a lot of experience. But what's troubled me the most through all of this is there's one or two big names 
I guess I can say him, Michael Saylor and this guy, Max, whatever his last name. Max and the Kaiser. media, the financial media people were just, these guys were coming on, especially Saylor and saying, listen, sell your stocks, sell your bonds, sell your business, sell your homes, borrow whatever you can, and don't put it in all cryptocurrencies, just put it in one. Well, I got to tell you, Steve, they used to do that about in the 80s and 90s about certain penny stocks, and those guys went to jail, okay? And here are these financial commentators, even after all of this happening, and two out of three trillions gone, poof, and they're still having these guys on and still going, oh, it's going to go back to 200 or 500,000 a million. To me, that is, if you ask me when is the bottom, when those guys are no longer out there doing that. And all those things you mentioned are just side notes to all the warnings that people, the relics I was called and too old and belong in a nursing home. When we tell them, listen, these things, you, you just don't see this. This is a bubble. Beyond. No, no, no. This is the reason why. And, and if you think about this, all those things that those guys said, why Bitcoin was the thing to own, because all those things are going to happen, happened, and it went down, not up. And yet, no financial commentary I see that has them on even questions them about this saying, well, what did you get wrong? Or how did, you know, okay, you want to talk about going up before that, just explain what you didn't see. Just, it's just snake. I called it, the, you know that I called it the tulip bowl mania of the 21st century. And these are just snake oil salesmen of the 21st century. It, isn't it insanity that in today's day, when we're freaked out about global temperatures, uh, temperatures rising, that, there's this currency that that's backed by wasting energy. That's that's what Bitcoin is. Is it's a bunch of computers guessing numbers to try to win a lottery so that they can you know mine more Bitcoin and 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 we're literally worried about cities like Miami being underwater. But then what does Miami do? Miami tries to make themselves the Bitcoin capital of the world. It's 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 absolute insanity. But then it's it's like a guy like you tries to go and warn everybody. They all come at you just ready to just, you know, have you killed, apparently. Um, and it, what I do notice, though, is that now that we're at 20,000 Bitcoin, um, and I used to get a lot of the same stuff, too. All those people seem to be gone now. Do you notice that? Well, what 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 what's still here is. Wall Street did sink a fair bit of money into it. It did manage to attract other than fringe yep. players. Uh, and, and and those folks don't like losing it all. So, you know, they're, they're going to try, you know, there's a guy out there, he's buying up some of these companies and, and it'll be a smaller package. And because it's a smaller package, whichever the survivors are. But what I just go back to is it's just, it was an everything bubble. And Steve, there's still one more part of that bubble that has to burst. And that's the real estate market. That's the last basket of this craziness of well above yeah. average returns. And that's just starting to roll over I, now. I, I, and so, I hope so. So, Steve, real important, the wealth effect. When you have all of this happen and you were living a lifestyle already beyond your means, and now things are blowing up that you were hoping were going to make you rich and famous and all that don't happen. And you look around and now things cost more and you have less, and you're driven an economy by consumer spending. That's why Walmart and Target came out a few weeks ago, and they warned about warnings that most people didn't listen to an important part. They actually showed that their sales of where people are spending money in their stores are leaving the disposable income items and going to the necessity items like food and all. And they talked why they brought that up is because they wanted to show their profits are going to be lower because they make far less money selling food than they do a TV or, or something exotic. But that was an indication already that the economy was turning down. So it's only going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, it's just, I just can't see any way around that. I hope you're right. Here in Canada, we have had real estate go up for like 30 years or something like that. And almost every young person you meet, whether they're a millennial or a generation Z or um, they, uh, a Zoomer, I guess uh, that, that they're calling them now, they all have an aunt or an uncle who owns like 10 income properties and they think real estate only goes up and they think that all you got to do is keep, uh, you know, 
going to the bank, refinancing and leveraging yourself up further to own more properties. And if you go on TikTok or Instagram or or even Twitter, you see some of these people, they've developed huge followings because everybody wants to be like them. They want to be that successful mortgage broker, real estate agent who, you know, owns 30 or 40 homes. Uh, but then what just happened with real estate is that I've now got friends that are, you know, in their late thirties and they're saying things to me like we can't afford to have kids or we can only afford to have one kid and then we're done. And they are good, hardworking people that did everything right, got a good job and they can't afford a home in, in, in the greater Toronto area. Now, my understanding is that Toronto might be a little bit further ahead than, than other places, but that certainly was happening in the U S it looks like it might be coming back a little bit now uh, since interest rates started going up. Uh, but, but these are big problems problems and unintended consequences with this just general monetary policy that I, I don't think anybody really wants to identify. Well, you can't because you would have to admit the terrible mistake it was to create these trillions of dollars uh, into a market on a highly questionable, uh, it's Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, but highly questionable did, uh, overreaction to when it first came out, we were all going to die if we went outside or anything of that nature. And we shut everything down with no thinking about, OK, if it's not all the worse and we, we turn this back on a year or two from now, what are the problems we're going to have with supply and all? No one thought about that. And, and that's the problem. Politicians don't think out 20 or 30 years anymore. They just think for the moment and, and the next election and what have you and so forth. But let me just answer one quick. And I don't know if this persist in Canada, but I know it's true here in the US. A lot of the real estate, particularly in homes, have been purchased not by people needing or wanting to step up, but as investment from investment firms and natures who are just like they were buying stocks. Instead, they bought homes hoping they can sell them higher and make money. They own a lot of them now. And if things slow down as it appears they started, they're going to have issues because they bought them for investments. And just like everybody else, they're not going to be able to hold on to them for years and years, especially if they start to go down in value. And uh, th that's the last bastion. That's the last piece of the bubble that is needs to roll over before there's any hope of a more realistic next cycle of you know better, more even keel economics for people. Because like you said, a lot of people being just priced out. They just they, they, they can't even afford a home. And at the same time, rents are going up so much. So even if they try the alternative of not having a home, uh, rents are just insane what people are, are getting for them. And it's 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 just not a very productive thing for everybody to focus on. I mean, there, there somebody and I uh, forgive me, I can't remember who it was. Went on a Twitter thread recently where they said that they had created five companies over the last fifteen years, uh, most of which went on to generate millions of dollars of revenue. Um, and you know, lots of productive things came out of these companies, or so the person was claiming. Uh, but had they have just bought a house? and kept leveraging up and buying more income properties in Canada, they would have ended up making more money than they ended up by creating all these businesses and, cre and creating all these jobs and uh, creating all these productive things. And I, I think that that's some of the stuff that gets lost with some of these policies. And even in a place like Canada, we have uh, like our national housing minister who owns a bunch of income properties. So it's just become a national pastime that it feels a lot like in Canada. We're sort of um, in we're, where the U.S. was in 2008, 2009. And now the Bank of Canada's... Uh, Chairman uh, Tiff Macklem is he's he's basically uh, you know hundred basis point raise this week and talking like he's just getting started now I don't know per perhaps he's on a power trip perhaps he's just trying to talk down the markets but uh, it's it's certainly uh, going to be an interesting time here uh, in in uh, in Canada uh, Peter uh, one last question for you. So going into the in, in into the back half of the year you're mostly um, skeptical about the markets what. What are you going to be focusing on uh, in, in Q3 and Q4? Well, I, I literally just put out, I felt the three metals now have come back to where the average person should consider them. Gold has been stuck in a trading range for three years. It's part of a handle from a, it's a technical term, but a cup and handle formation. It's 1650 has been the bottom, 2000 is the top. You know, with $50 from that bottom, we're at 300 and something dollars from the top. I think gold is now should be looked at for people just for capital appreciation, not because there's the end of the world or anything of that nature. The other metal that I think is perhaps the closest thing 
to feeling certain about in my entire career, and that's uranium. Uh, there's just no way we can move forward in this world uh, and, and, and need energy still, not go back to living in caves without nuclear energy now becoming a key part of providing that energy. Solar and wind, it's clearly not going to be just the answer. And politics has flipped 180 on it. The people were, that were against it now are the people demanding as fast as we can to build them. And so I really like the uranium market. There's not a lot of ways to play it, but the ways that are, you know, like the chemicals of the world or the Sprott owning, you know, having an exposure to physical. And I think copper has come back. You know, copper is a very interesting story, Steve. You know, I know you talk about everybody's talking the electrification of the world. Uh, you know, we're all going, it has to be. And I understand that. Well, that they, they say that the demand for copper is going to double by 2035. In fact, they expect the S&Ps just come out and said that uh, 53 million metric tons a year is going to be needed. That's more copper than was consumed between 1900 and 2021 in the entire world. So it takes 10 to 15 years to discover these things develop and all. We certainly can't meet that demand now. And literally by the price declining and not getting to six or seven where some money would have been thrown at to build some or more of these high cost coppers, we're going to have even more of a deficit now. So I just think if you can find appropriate companies, obviously I'm prejudiced. I think I have one, but it's going to have to be in fairly safe places of the world. You can't throw a dot anymore at a world map and say, let's go there. You just can't. That's how mining was done 20, 30 years ago. Now you have to be very specific and take a lot of risk out. And uh, so I, I think now is a good time to start looking uh, for the balance of the year at, at copper plays that are more than grassroots that are developing a project and are properly funded to take it further. All right. Well, Peter, thanks so much for hopping on here. It's always a treat whenever I get to uh, chat with you. And hopefully you'll come back on here in the future and uh, continue to give us your views as this uh, crazy experiment uh, that all these central banks are performing on this world right now uh, continue to play out and uh, you can help us make some sense of it. Well, Steve, if I can ever, you know, Canada was my home away from home. I loved it. And if I ever can get in there without having to take the vaccine, I'm going to come and see you. Well, that would be awesome. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, Peter. Take care. God bless. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. And if you haven't already, hit the like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. And also let us know what you think of the comment section. Where is the price of silver heading, gold, uranium? How are you positioning your book for the second half of 2022 and into 2023? All right. Thank you, everybody.